the picture of the vineyard is, is something that we're very familiar with here in the, the Niagara region. No matter what road you drive down, you're going to see a vineyard sooner or later. It's going to be there. See, the soil is such that producing quality grapes of many different varieties has proven over the last hundred years to be a very viable industry. In fact, the, the grape growers of Ontario, their organization has just celebrated their 70th anniversary. And it's an industry that's growing and developing year after year. Well, Jesus develops, uh, begins his analogy by qualifying it. He states that he is the true vine. He is the, the veritable or the actual vine is what the word true means. Now, by implication, that would mean that there are other vines that are not true if he specifies that he is the true vine. And absolutely, the vine that we were born with, the roots that we had, our, our sinful nature is not of the truth. It's not true. Psalm 51 relates David's cry to God. He says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Uh, the King James says, I was born in sin and shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 and 11 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands there was no one who seeks God. That is the root that each one of us was born with. That is the, the heritage. That is the original sin that we have within us. Now, there is something interesting about grapevines, and not everyone knows this. Almost every vine that grows here in Niagara has to be grafted onto a different rootstock. All the vines that you see growing, nearly every one of them, needed to be grafted into a different rootstock. The natural stock it grew uh, from was very susceptible to disease. And in fact, disease at one time almost wiped out the entire vineyards of Europe. And they found that there was a, an American root. And I went to an expert when I was asking about this. I, I went to, to Matthias and asked him about this because he is the chair of the Ontario Grape Growers and, and he knows. He knows. And, and uh, they found that the American, some of the American vines were more, more resistant to disease. And so all of the vines needed to be grafted into a hardy rootstock that would allow the, the fruit to grow normally without disease and deformity. Now let me explain what grafting is. Some of you know, but for those who don't, bear with me. What they do is they take a vine and they cut the rootstock off of it. They cut it in a notch like that, like a little point. Then they take a hardy rootstock and they cut a notch into it. They put the two together. They bind it up until it solidifies, it scars over, it heals. And then the nutrients that begin to flow through that new vine come through this root stock that it was grafted into. Now, this is important. In a few moments, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper, and Jesus says, this is my body which is broken for you. See, that's exactly what happens at salvation. Our old sinful root of sin is cut off and we are grafted into the true vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our root of sin had one destiny and that was hell. But because Jesus Christ, his body was broken, and think of it, every time someone is saved, they are being grafted into the body of Jesus Christ as the true vine. But in order for that to take place, his body had to be broken. We all know the story of Easter. How he was scourged with the cat of nine tails. and 39 times that whip tore into his flesh. 
We all know the thorns that were driven into his skull. We know about the nails that were thrust through his hands and his feet. We know the spear that opened up his side. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. See, our old sinful root of sin is cut off and we are grafted into Jesus Christ. It is then his blood that begins to flow through our veins. And as he said to Nicodemus, you are born again. You're not who you are. You're not who you were. You are are now in me. 1 John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. 2 Corinthians 5 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. So he says, I am the true vine. And he says, my father is the gardener, the vine dresser. Continues this analogy by, by specifically attributing the responsibility of dressing the vines to his father. He's the gardener. Now, pruning is absolutely essential if the vine is to produce. The, the grape growing industry is extremely hands on, it's very labor intensive. And the father is shown as the gardener whose task is to prune the vines in order to produce the best. The most quality, the fruit possible. See, we are saved to bear fruit. We are saved to be productive for the kingdom of God. In this passage of scripture, there are four categories of fruit. There's no fruit, there's some fruit, there's more fruit, and then there is much fruit that is produced. He says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. See, the father cuts up branch that, that it's, it's just dead wood, realizing that Jesus is talking to those who believe that they're Christians because he says, every branch in me. Every branch in me. Now, how is it possible that once a person is saved that they bear no fruit? How is it possible that someone would value the Christian experience so lightly that they would give no consideration to why they're part of the family of God? Well, perhaps it would be helpful to define what fruit is. And uh, Bruce Wilkinson, in his book, The Secrets of the, of the Vine, describes it. He defines fruit this way. Number one, it says, fruit usually means good works. Titus chapter 3 says, And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. So there's an element of good works that's involved in producing fruit. The second thing, fruit can only be produced by those who are in Christ. It says, see, not all good works can be considered fruit. Isaiah chapter 64 says, All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. See, not all our good works can be considered fruitful, but only those that are in Christ. Third way that Wilkinson defines fruit is, it's a good work that is done with a God-honoring motive. John 15, 16, later on in this chapter, says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. It's, it's, it's a work that honors God. The fourth way he defines fruit is fruit is any action of any believer that pleases God. Colossians says, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. And the fourth way that he defines fruit, it's the result of your effort and your labor. In Philippians says, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Can I let you in on a little secret? You don't get fruit by doing nothing. 
You don't get fruit by doing nothing. You know what you get by doing nothing? Nothing. The questions get harder, believe me. So the goal of every Christian is to bear fruit, and not just a little bit, but a lot. Now remember that there's, there, there, here's where the activity of the Christian and the gardener comes in. Because there's four categories of fruit. There's no fruit, there's fruit, there's more fruit, and then there's much fruit. See, God our Father is very skillful at how to effectively prune our lives in order to achieve the greatest yield possible of fruit for his glory. Well, he starts in verse 2 by cutting off the unproductive, non-productive branches. This is not a good thing for the branch. I've noticed that whenever you cut a branch off a tree, it's not long before that branch starts to wither up and die. I've noticed that it's not good for the branch to be cut off. Who are these branches? Who is it that caused the Father to sever them? Well, possibly. It's those who pray just a token prayer at salvation, but have never truly given their hearts to the Lord. They've never made him the Lord of their lives. They're still living a totally selfish and self-centered existence that give only lip service to, to Jesus. I'm sad to say that there are many in our churches today across Canada that know about Jesus, but they don't really know him. Branches that bear no fruit. There's no fruit. But then the pruning doesn't stop here. The father then turns his attention over to those who are actually producing fruit. Their lives are growing, and he begins to cut away things that are not helpful and actually only take the necessary nutrients away from the branches that are producing. An old farmer once told Bruce Wilkinson, he says, you can have grapes or you can have leaves, but you can't have both. And so what happens is the father begins to prune away those things. They're not necessarily wrong, but they're not helpful. Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but not everything is expedient or not everything is helpful. These are good branches. There's nothing wrong with them, but they actually hinder the production of fruit, and they need to be removed. They only suck up the nutrients that should be going elsewhere. You see, I like to grow tomatoes, and I grow a lot of them. But I know that every tomato plant, you need to break off the, the little suckers that grow in. They don't produce fruit. They just take away the nutrients. And then sometimes if there's too many leaves, you've got to cut those off so that the fruit can get the sunlight and can be seen. Nothing wrong with the leaves. It's just not fruit. I haven't yet come across a recipe for tomato leaves. If you know one out there, keep it. I'm not interested. <laughs> And then something that they also do, and I saw this as I dropped my wife off for work one day, I drove by the vines and there was a whole bunch of clusters just lying on the ground. See, the wise gardener will go through and they'll start to clip off some of the less productive clusters of grapes so that all the nutrients can go to the, f the fat full ones to produce the best quality that is there. Let me ask you a question. How many of you believe that God only has your best interests at heart? Do you believe that? Do you believe that everything he takes out of your life is because he loves you and he wants the best for you? Do you believe that everything he allows in your life is for your good because he loves you and wants the best for you? In explaining this to his disciples, Jesus was quick to assure them that their salvation was not in question here when 
the pruning took place to produce more fruit and much fruit. In verse 3, he told them, says, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. And then he, had, he added in verse 4, but remain in me as I also remain in you. See, the purpose of pruning is not to harm the vine, but to, to help it produce the way that it was meant to produce without all of these other distractions. And once you're saved, all the dead wood is cut off, our, our old sinful life. And as we continue to grow, the process of pruning continues as things, and even if they're good in themselves, are cut off so that we can be who God intends us to be. See, God's plan is to fashion us after the image of his Son. Romans 8.29 says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. See, that's, that's God's plan. That's the purpose of pruning, to continue to cut away those things that are not part of the picture that God has of his Son. And allow the life of Jesus that flows through us to produce as much fruit as possible. God has a unique picture for your life. The ultimate picture is to look like Jesus. But the unique picture is how you look like Jesus. How does that work out? Well, that means there may be certain things in my life that are perfectly legitimate that he wants to cut away so that I become even more productive. They may be different than the things he cuts away in your life that have only proven to be distractions and things that divert your eyes away from the true purpose. Are they wrong? No. They're just not necessary. They're not the best that he could possibly see in you. But Jesus was very clear, and he told his disciples that the key to all of this was to remain in him, being sure that they were attached to the vine. We are grafted in. Later in Romans, Paul is, is talking about how, how God's plan has not been to abandon the Jews. But his love for them was such that it was so much easier to graft in a natural branch back into the vine. We, the Gentiles, we've been grafted in, and it's only through the blood of Jesus that we're able to be partakers of this gift of salvation. But then he plainly tells them in verse 4, No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. He says, Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. See, there's no way that we can do anything of value for the kingdom of God unless we do it through the power of Christ that dwells in us. Therefore, we need to remain in him. Jude, the 21st verse says, Keep yourselves in the love of God and wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Keep yourself in God's love. Grapes uh, need full sun in order to ripen properly. And they ripen at uh, different times and different schedules. I love driving through the fields and, and seeing the clusters just hanging off the bottom of the vines. That, that's an amazing thing to see. And all the different varieties, the different colors, the different sizes. That's, that's what we're to produce. Different ways, different times. It's all for his glory. See, any branch that, that begins to obscure the sun needs to be cut away. And, and any branch that begins to obscure Jesus in our life needs to be pruned away so that we can mature and fully reflect Jesus and Thereby bear much fruit. 
Colleen Evans, in her book, The Vine Life, tells us that's why we need the vine dresser. See, the branches cannot weed themselves. The Father uses the Holy Spirit to prove the world wrong about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. And we need to allow him to do his work. Too often we get caught up in the, I need to try harder syndrome. As if everything depends on us. Where all the while we need to trust in him and allow him to do what only he can do. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this. <clears throat> that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. See, that's why we need to be attached to the vine. She says, why does God have to prune us? Because we could never do it on our own. And then she gives a little illustration, just like, says, just like the family dog who would never give itself a bath and douse itself with the flea-killing soap. Neither would we prune away the dead or destructive areas of our lives by ourselves, even though the outcome is for our good. I got a question for you. How many find it hard to throw things away? You need to poke somebody in the ribs right now and says, he's talking to you. Listen. A friend of mine years ago says, the amount of stuff we accumulate is comparable only to the amount of space we have to accumulate the stuff. You know, one of the greatest industries that's growing up is self-storage, where you take useless stuff from your house and store it in a storage place so you don't have to get rid of your useless stuff. How many in the spring like going to garbage, I mean garage sales? <laughs> we find it hard to get rid of things. Even if they're broken and you haven't used it in 20 years. Oh, I can't throw that away. Why? I might need it. It doesn't work. Well, I can fix it. You haven't fixed it in 20 years. I'm looking for some time. <laughs> One of my favorite places to visit is the dump. And I load up my car, or a friend will load up his trailer, and we will take stuff there, and sometimes for five dollars, I get rid of a whole load of useless junk. Isn't that a wonderful feeling? But we hold on to things that are taking up much needed storage space that we could use for other things. So what are some of the branches that need to be cut away? See, there was a point to that question. In every one of our lives, there's areas of dead wood that needs to be cut off. There's areas of distraction that need to be cut off. There's areas of things that obscure our vision and view of Jesus that need to be cut off. So what are some of those branches? Here's just a few. And please, feel free to add others that you know apply to your lives. Maybe there's areas of unforgiveness or bitterness that you've held on to for far too long that need to be cut away. Maybe you're holding on to a hurt and you're not letting go. Maybe it's a, a secret sin that you've tried to bury, uh, lust or, or greed, that you've just tried to, to hide it. Maybe it's pride or stubbornness. See, the list goes on. Colleen Evans says, Scripture makes it clear that 
that the primary cause of fruitlessness in any life is any conscious yielding to sin. The greatest cause of fruitlessness is any conscious yielding to sin. See, the key here is a conscious yielding. We're, we're aware of it, but we just don't want to get rid of it. And we wonder why we're not as productive as we could be for Jesus. And just as the fruit needs full sun and the leaves and the branches are removed so that the fruit is not shattered in darkness, so God cuts away the areas of death and decay to leave more room for his light to shine in. And we hear his promise. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And I end with this before we go into communion where we remember his body was broken so we could be grafted in. When we surrender our lives to him and fully trust that what he is doing in our lives is for our good, he will surely answer our prayers for help in order for us to continue to bear fruit for his glory. Do you believe that this morning? Do you? Father, let these words become life and breath in our souls and draw us close to you in Jesus' name. Amen.